Yes, welcome again. Welcome everyone. So nice to be here together. So nice to have you all here um, online and in person. We are continuing <clears throat> to move our way through this really beautiful text here as an inspiration for our practice tonight and our, um, yeah, I hope discussion as well. So we're moving through this book no Time to Lose, and it's a secondary text, meaning an interpretation and um, a lot of really helpful enhancements by Pema Chodron on an ancient text, an 8th century text called The Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life. Such a classic text and referenced by so many wonderful teachers because it really, I mean, in some ways, really orients us towards the pith of the path. And one way of describing that is there is no such thing as individual well-being. It's like a fantasy. Like the only way for any of us to experience something like freedom or ease or peace and love is all together. And that takes phases and stages. That doesn't mean that all of us all the time are exerting 100% of our effort in making that true. It does mean that we orient more and more and more of our thoughts, of our heart, of our feelings, away from only what relates to us and what works for us and what we like and don't like, and start to really include all other beings in the way that we think about the world and ourselves and others. And it's really hard. Whether we are elevating ourselves or putting ourselves down, we are the center of attention <laughs> in like 99% of our thoughts, uh, when we're sleeping, even when we're awake. And so a lot of the kind of outrageousness of this text and why it is still so beloved by so many teachers is it's a very strong call for us to open our heart for the sake of all beings and clear instructions on how to do so step by step. And we have a really, yeah, we have such a beautiful um, piece of this work to do together tonight. We often do uh, practice here together of compassion called Tonglen, in which we really use the generosity of our heart to invite in the difficulty or pain or suffering of others and kind of transform that and offer that out. And this is in some ways, it's. It's not that it's its opposite, but there's a balancing factor of this is really offering up not only, you know, the warmth of our heart and offering to engage with the difficulties that other are experiencing. This is a willingness to share and offer what is good that we experience in the world in like every single moment, like all of the beauty, all of the joys. So I just had this amazing pupusa across the street. <laughs> Shout out Espiga del Oro is very delicious. And, you know, just the simple, you know, like really allowing myself to be with, you know, the taste of like the freshly made food and all the harmony of those tastes. And without it becoming kind of flippant or superficial, like really the sense bringing my mindfulness so that I can take it in with all my senses. And then this natural gratitude and reciprocity also arises for how that food was made possible. And then that kind of gesture of, wow, wouldn't it be wonderful if all beings felt so nourished and had such a harmony of hot sauce and cabbage and the crunch and the cheese. Right? But I joke, but like really, it's just this way of infiltrating our mind stream more and more and more with these different ways that we can be caring and be open. And so the this this chapter is such an awesome invocation to beauty, uh, to experiencing beauty and to sharing beauty, um, both of which, you know, obviously are so wonderful to do. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Everybody found a seat. So that's our chapter for the night. And what I'd like for us to do as we've been weaving a bit is start with a practice more around intention is a you know if this is your first time here a very simple way of saying what is you know the guide to the bodhisattva way of life it's shifting and changing our intentions and changing our intentions to include liberation for the sake of all beings so there's really 
that focus on intention. There's also a huge part of this book, which is training the heart and mind to do that and to do that well. <clears throat> and so we've been working for the last couple of weeks on expanding and extending awareness. So we'll do one more evening of that because we've kind of had a good momentum for some of us who've been engaging with those practices. And if you haven't, no worries, we'll walk you through those practices. So we'll have a little bit of a two part, but last time I kind of blasted us all out into spacious awareness and then we didn't have time to talk about it. So we'll start that earlier this time, <laughs> definitely. Um, but I, I wanna, before I launch totally into this intention and infusing intention with offering, uh, just want to kind of remind us of this collective space here together. So this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective as some of you know well, and for others of you, maybe it's your first time. This is an entirely volunteer run center. There are many volunteers here in the room. And what that means is we are literally here as a result of generosity of others, right? Who keep the center open, who work here to make it possible. And then, you know, it kind of highlights that each and every one of us here is engaging in generosity. It would be an entirely different night if even one person wasn't here in person or online. And there's so much generosity in showing up for the Dharma with each other. So I just want to appreciate you all because it's, you could be doing anything. Like Dolores Park is probably popping off right now, right? You know, such a beautiful night in San Francisco and here you are, right? To um, be with others and be with these teachings. So just feel, I feel a lot of appreciation for that. And I hope you can sense that with one another, you know, even though this is a community gathering just for tonight, we're gathering with a shared purpose. And that really lifts the whole enterprise, right? So quite beautiful. And part of what we do here in the Dharma Collective is, you know, I love sharing these teachings and being at the front of the room supporting you all. And I really love hearing from you all. And in order for us to do that, we kind of engage every single time we meet in this specific set of agreements. And the most simple way of saying them is how can we be the least harmful to ourselves and others? Harmful in body, speech, and mind. So part of that is, you know, more or less holding the form of practice. So when we're meditating, you know, more or less meditating, not running to the bathroom or running out the door or striking on a gong or something in the middle, right? So we're doing that with our body, but then with our speech, when folks are sharing here, we're really considerate and conscientious of our words and how we're saying them. And is it compassionate what we're saying for others? Not only is it useful for us, and maybe most importantly, can we be compassionate with how we listen to one another? You know, those sneaky little judgments that just like rise up, uh, these ideas or maybe biases that we kind of carry with us while we are here exercising and practicing so much compassion for what others are sharing. Because these practices, we were, some of us were talking earlier, we don't practice meditation to become good meditators, right? We practice so that we can engage in more healthy and loving ways with one another. Uh, my teacher calls that like the waking down process, not just the waking up process. And by that, it's embodied, it's relational, it's connecting. So does that sound reasonable here? Yes? Okay, wonderful. So this first, I wanna read just a little bit about our first practice. And um, yeah, we've moved on out of chapter one, only took us a month. Um, <laughs> this is like quite rich material. And um, you know, chapter one, it was really interested and interesting on getting us motivated for this outrageous goal of bodhicitta or waking up the heart for the sake of all beings and how important it is for us to cultivate an all-inclusive compassion, compassion for all beings. And that we, in order to do so, simultaneously need to cultivate the flexible, unbiased wisdom mind. Really both hard, 
compassion for every single person, including everyone you got annoyed with today already, right? And maybe we found like that was a, us, we were annoyed with ourselves or others, like that might not be in the moment, but can we immediately after say, yeah, that was my annoyance and I also can understand or feel compassion or care for the situation. And then the f flexible, unbiased wisdom mind is the mind that sees really clearly everything is changing, everything will end, like sees the impermanence, sees that um, there is sickness, old aging, old age and death, and still can find peace in that, not like that's an affront that doesn't include us, like integrating that so foundationally into our understanding that just becomes natural. So those are these ways we're working um, with all of the practices in this book. And um, yeah, the, uh, the thing I think is really important also is in that first chapter in cultivating this aspiration and tension for all beings to achieve awakening, it doesn't mean that we have to start immediately acting. A lot of what we do is with this intention and aspiration. It's like we're massaging the heart before we send out the, um, the sentries of the heart to do that work. And in, and in doing that intention and aspiration, sometimes people feel like it's just words. Like here I am just saying, I want others to be free. Like, what does that do? But what it does is prevents us from the reactive shutting down of the heart, from that reactive callousing of the heart, from which it's much harder to open when action is needed. So we're like getting the heart at the ready. That's what the intentions are for. And, um, you know, this aspiration and intentional bodhicitta, it does require us to really kind of loosen the grips of only thinking about ourselves and only thinking about those who are in our immediate circle. And that can be, as, as one person said a couple of weeks back, exhausting. Like, how can I do that? How can I hold every, I already have enough. I don't want to include more. And just out of curiosity, we need to explore whether holding our heart open is actually more tiring than closing our heart. And I think many of us have tried both. And when you try to close your heart down, you're also closing down a sense of meaning and purpose in this world. Because what makes us feel good, what makes us feel happy is connection with others. And that closing down of the heart to others, like it's not something we, like you can kind of do like, I'll just close my heart down to those people. But that kind of, that's like this contracted level of the heart. So just an invitation, I'm not going to tell you what to think or feel about it, but I will say I, I find it compelling and I think worth exploring whether this intention is actually more exhausting than the kind of suppression and shutting down. So for tonight, the theme of this chapter, there's two. Tonight I think we're only going to get to offering. And then the next is confession. It's like my favorite chapter where, as Chogyam Trimpa says, we kind of collectively confess to our neurotic thought crimes um, as a way of purifying the mind stream. So that's going to be juicy. But tonight, we prepare the ground by um, really developing and engaging in this practice of, uh, of offering. And what's interesting about uh, this idea of offering is some of you are, I'm sure, very familiar with this term merit. Like a lot of things that are done in our everyday life in, in the context of the, the Buddhist cosmology is it's gaining merit or, you know, has merit. And, and many religious traditions have this, right? You do good and you kind of earn good, right? But merit is really interesting because it definitely is generated through our beneficial activities. But the whole... Um, the whole idea of merit is it moves us towards bodhicitta. Like we actually are, it has a little bit of a um, kind of three purposes. So when I'll read this part here of Pema describing it. Um, so when we 
are going to be doing these practices together of making offering. It's to gain the precious attitude of bodhicitta. Um, mm -hmm -hmm. Oh wait, that's not it. Here we go. <laughs> By making offerings to the Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, and other objects of veneration, we connect not only with our expansive expansiveness, but also with the warm devotion of love. By making offerings to those who are suffering and in need of help, we gain access to the tenderness and compassion. So the seemingly simple practice of giving, opening up and letting go can be profoundly transformative. Whatever moves us beyond self-centeredness sows positive seeds in the mind stream. And those with the right causes and condition, these seeds turn into fortunate circumstances and this good fortune is called merit. It manifests as supportive outer conditions and mental states. The ultimate merit comes from connecting with the unbiased clarity of our mind. So there's this interesting, it, it can sound a little transactional, but our offering up, our offering up of beauty, our offering up of joy, and we'll get into these a little bit deeper. There is this idea that that's actually, in some ways, it's like going up the river and taking out the pollutants, right? But in our own mind. And it's clarifying this mind stream. We're kind of, instead of adding pollutants, we're like adding jewels and gems into our mind. Because we're constantly and consistently offering and expanding the heart with generosity. And that that's, it's like you're, you're sowing the seed in the heart. And that's the, how the merit is generated. And over time, that really leads to the conditions where we achieve awakening, right? We actually do have an opening that sustains with our heart and mind. Um, and it's interesting, you know, again, I, I sometimes have a little aversion towards merit because it seems like this point system we're working towards, like, oh, I just need merit. But it, instead, it's, it's really, it really is very aligned with the law of karma. If we are enacting things that are very positive and generative, it's going to lead to positive conditions in our life, right? And, and all around us. So the way that uh, these offerings happen here, and I kind of want us to be inspired for our own practice, is um, the, the author, the original author of this 8th century text, Shantideva, <clears throat> becomes extremely poetic in his offering. He says, I offer every fruit and flower every kind of healing medicine, all the precious thing the world affords, with all pure waters of refreshment, every mountain, rich and filled with jewels, all sweet and lonely forest groves, the trees of heaven garlanded with blossoms, and branches heavy with fruit, the perfumed fragrance of the realms of the gods and men and women, all incense wishing trees and trees of gems, all crops that grow without the tiller's care, and even the sumptuous objects, ev every sumptuous object worthy to be offered, lakes adorned with lotuses, and plaintive with the sweet cries of water birds, and lovely to the eyes, and all things wild and free, stretching to the boundless limits of the sky. I hold them all before my mind to the supreme Buddhas and their heirs. I will make this perfect gift of them, Think of me with love and compassion. These sacred objects of my prayers accept these offerings. I am empty handed, destitute of merit. I have no other wealth, but you, you protectors whose thoughts are for the good of others in your great power, accept this for my sake. So it's, he's offering literally everything that he can experience in the eye and its goodness and offering it to the Buddhas to ask for their protection, for ask for their support. We're also kind of offering it in that same way to all beings, like everything that I'm experiencing. And, you know, this also comes all the way home. You know, I offer them myself through every life, supreme and courageous ones, accept me totally. For with devotion, I will be your servant. If you accept me, I will benefit all and freed from fear, I'll go beyond the evils of my past and ever after turn my face from them. So there's just this very um, 
beautiful and nuanced like listing of all things beautiful and then this expansion of offering them up entirely. What I really appreciate about this practice, I've been doing this all week now of trying to do like, you know, instantaneous offering is it makes you so much more mindful and present with the beauty that is all around. So first of all, actually noticing the beauty that's all around. And then second, especially when it comes to the natural world, you're engaging in this gratitude that can also feel like a reciprocity of appreciation. Like by seeing and noting the beauty of the natural world, you're kind of offering, you know, your attention, your care, your heart back. And it's so beautiful to try and <clears throat> be in that more reciprocal loving relationship with the natural world, right? Not just, oh, that's pretty, but like, wow, like I rejoice, I feel so much beauty, I, I, can, I can recognize the goodness in that. And then the offering. So we recognize the awareness, then we can see and really take in the beauty and that reverence or that reciprocity. And then it's not about us enjoying it. It's about offering it up. So it's such this beautiful kind of like multifaceted act. So I would love us, I'll read more on this chapter, but I'd love us to start together in setting our intention and then also being able to consider and offer. And so I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, especially in these warmer days, maybe we've experienced some beauty outside that we could imagine offering right, some beauty. So we're going to engage in that process of first really connecting with our own intention. I will invite us to have a personal intention, like why we are here tonight together, what brought us here today, that's relevant. I'll then invite us to this more bodhisattva intention, this greater or broader intention to wake up for the sake of all beings. And then to kind of pull us into the practice this evening I'll ask us together to consider these offerings in the mind, to offer up beauty. And this is, I like to think of it as, you know, you're kind of <clears throat> cleaning the temple, right? And like putting out flowers and incense and candles. And there's a reason that that's done, right? It's, it's this symbolic offering of what we feel devotion towards, what we recognize as higher than ourselves, beautiful. Not higher as in better, but just greater putting ourself in the right position with the whole universe, which is honestly bowing, let's be real. <laughs> so that is what we will be doing. So take a moment and find a posture. Supportive, this first practice will only be maybe about 10, 15 minutes. Oh, Mary Zell was here and she returned the meditation. Oh, that's nice. We've had these alternate meditation bell ringers for a while. It's been interesting. giving ourselves a moment to really find a sense of our body in this physical place, in this space. And to begin the practice, allowing ourselves to feel our sense of space and place through all the senses, noticing what we can notice through what we can feel on the skin, what we can hear around us, any light scents or tastes, even noticing the play of light between 
the eyelids. Feeling and knowing the body from within the body. Noticing and welcoming also whatever is here and felt in the body at the level of our emotion residue from the day. Maybe we experience some tingling of excitement or some heaviness of worry. Just fully allowing ourselves to be with what is here, just as it is. And to help with some vividness for our practice, we can do a practice of counting the breaths. We do this at the very top of the inhale, silently counting, beginning at one, and just going to 11. This allows our mind something to do, to focus, to settle into the body and the breath. But the practice is a practice of breathing, not counting. So really attending closely to the inhale and exhale but just noting very briefly at the top of the inhale, one, and then continuing on until 11. If you find yourself distracted, you can start over and just keep going. If you've finished the counting or it just isn't working for you, no problem. Just a little bit longer here with our full attention and awareness saturating the breath.
And then gently shifting attention and awareness from the breath to the mind and imagination. And allowing this question to just simply drop into the mind and heart of why and what motivated you to be here this evening. This could be simply a felt sense in the body or a word or phrase. Maybe there's something more like a a pulling of the mind or heart. And just pay attention and give yourself a bit more room and space. And even to consider once again, what is it that brought you here tonight? And while still holding this feeling or image or thought, opening also to this shared intention of bodhicitta, the awakened heart, to consider this outrageous possibility of an intention of waking up for the sake of each and every being, now and in the future as long as space endures, so too shall I remain to alleviate the suffering and sorrowing of the world. And simply notice whatever can be noticed in the heart without a lot of concepts or ideas this idea of having the warrior of compassion within your own heart. May I be an island for those who need landfall, a lamp for those seeking light. For those who are weary and tired, may I be a bed for them to rest. And those who are sick and ill, may I be both medicine and doctor. Taking a moment and considering as part of this intention, this practice of offering. Considering if in today or in recent days, there was a glimpse of beauty that you would like to offer and share. And this can simply be bringing it close to mind, maybe a view of one of the hills of San Francisco with just a certain amount of light. And in the heart and in the mind, consider, may I offer this beauty? May I offer this beauty to move me towards an awakened heart? May I offer this beauty to share and expand the consideration of what it means to experience beauty.
And then allowing yourself to notice again, what is stirred in the body, not just the words, what does it feel like to make that offering? Giving yourself enough time to feel it and then moving on to something else you would like to offer some other beauty or joy. First, allowing yourself to really recall, make vivid and so clear this beauty, feeling the way it can move the heart, bring such goodness, and then offering with the heart. that all beings could experience this beauty, this fullness of heart, this lifting and joy. If you get distracted or daydreamy, no problem. Just a little bit longer here, bringing to mind beauty, rejoicing, really feeling that beauty, and then offering it, offering it for all beings, offering it as a supplication or invitation to receive the blessings towards bodhicitta. And again, noticing what you feel in the heart and in the body. And gently coming back to the breath, and releasing the images, feeling the body in this space and in this place and in this moment.
someone make sure she's okay? Thank you. Thank you for your practice. So I'd be curious from folks, any, any thoughts, any reflections on offering? How'd it go? How'd it feel? Good. There's a microphone here for folks in the room and for folks online, you can raise a hand or otherwise. Good, good. Yes. Hey, Jay, would you mind handing that back? Thank you so much. Um, hello, my name is. It's not. Um, it's just. To use. It's just so people can hear online. Okay. Yeah, not amplified. Um, I felt just so much beauty. Mm -hmm. Um so much love. Mm. I was seeing my children mm. hand me, pick flowers and then hand them to me. Mm. And I just, to give that, yeah, you know, to people, just that me being offered something and then wanting to offer that to the world, you know, just like that innocence. Mm. It was just, a, it was so many things, but that was the Thing that I wanted to share. Mm. Um, the whole experience was beautiful. So mm. thank you for yeah. guiding that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I could, I could feel it when you said it, just receiving those flowers. And yeah, I mean, it's kind of like it's heartbreaking, but in this beautiful way, you know, breaking open. It's, um, yeah, it's surprising in some ways. Thank you. Anyone else? We can just pass it forward. Sure, I can go. <laughs> <laughs> Fallen told, yeah. yeah. Um, I uh, got to be out in nature backpacking this weekend. Mm. And so I was just like thinking about some of the beautiful views that we had, um, but I felt like when I was out there and also when I was remembering it just like so humble and mm. small and like the grandness of nature. Yeah. And so I did have this like initial response of like, this isn't mine to offer to anyone. Uh -huh. like, Good. Yeah. I'm just here to like, <clears throat> receive it. Yeah. Um, but coming back to the like wish for all people to experience something like that. Um, but it, the kind of like sense of ownership around yeah. it kind of like, Got a little sticky from you. Yeah, okay. yeah. Very good noticing. Um, specifically, this idea. So it says <clears throat> these first offerings of nature's bounty: fruits and flowers, waters, mountain trees can't be owned, but they could be. They could be. But these offerings could be made by the poorest of the poor. We could offer the sky, the sound of birds, the pleasure of seeing a sunrise. Um, every sumptuous um, um, that we enjoy. But by seizing these moments of delights, we always have a precious gift on hand. So it, and not like an ownership, but like by, you know, really receiving the gifts around us, we then have something to offer, which is, it's in a way like describing how to fill your own cup to offer to others. So I, I get it, you know, it's not like, Look at this great view. And, and I was thinking about how different this practice is than sharing on social media. <laughs> like, yeah. like, you know, there's nice photos. People post really nice photos, but such a different intention, right? It's coming from such a different place. And it doesn't usually, well, I don't know. I don't know if, I don't know if it fills anybody else. And I don't even know if it fills the person posting that beautiful photo, right? There's such a different agenda and intention. So again, feeling that sense of how powerful intention is in like taking in this beauty. So, thanks. Anybody else question or comment? Yes, Tanya. Thank you. Um, 
Um, in, earlier today, I I, um, I found out that someone, my dad passed away. I found out that someone that I had trusted had um, made unwise choices that weren't honest with me. Hmm. And I was like, Oh, I have to, I should be upset about this. Like, I'm supposed to be upset about this. And, and I was like, but that person has had a really hard life. And so what would it be like? Not what would it be like, but so in this practice, I started just opening my heart, um, which had already been open, but also open, close, open, close. Mm. Um, and my uncle said, trust your gut. And so I was like, what is it? What, am, what is my inside saying? And um, just tapping into that compassion and that understanding of unwise choices, whatever, sometimes they are very unwise. Hmm. <laughs> and sometimes they're a little unwise. And, um, but what does it mean to make room for that in hmm. a really profound way? And, you know, there's this idea that you're being, you're letting someone walk all over you or they don't know. And it's like, well, maybe that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah. You know, so I don't know. I, that's yeah. kind of where my practice went. And so it's easy for me to tap into like the beauty of things. Yes. But what happens when you're tapping into the hardness of something and mm. finding not beauty in it, but just that breaking open. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. And but again, I it's not I'm not trying to say that I'm doing a good thing here. Like I, I'm actually trying to figure it out. Yeah. It's not like, oh, and I'm just such a nice person. Like someone really <laughs> wronged me and I'm just feeling compassion for them. It's not yes. that I'm just feeling into not going towards beauty in the easier places, but going towards it in the harder ones. That's what I'm trying to feel. Into. Yeah, no, and beautifully described. And I think what's so interesting is when we open our heart to bodhicitta, like we sometimes don't get to choose, right? Like where it goes or where it doesn't go. And um, earlier um, when we were talking in this uh, gathering, it was like when we can even have that towards ourselves with our criticism or negativity, you know, such a beautiful way for bodhicitta to, to arise. And um, I loved your phrase, which was like, what would bodhicitta do? Like that's a, <laughs> right. And, and so that starts to really infuse our mind stream. So just as you said, like when a difficulty or painful experience arises, instead of our normal contraction and self-centeredness, there is a bit more space. However, that's like a very, you know, close or similar way that you know we can act when we're acting out of codependent tendencies so it's very hard to know the difference sometimes right when it's like this desire to be supportive and loving and caring can be so informed by compassion but it can also end up coming from a place of i just want everyone to be okay i'll be okay right and so we do really need to kind of have that clear seeing and wisdom for ourselves um, lifetime worth <laughs> of practice <clears throat> you know i i just think it's it's you know there's no um there's no like specific rules like oh well when you let someone do this it's codependence but if you do that it's not it's more noting in ourselves what is it we're trying to not feel um and then what again like how clear we can be on our intentions and it's so easy to do the spiritual bypassing to use our spiritual practice to kind of like, you know, just um, cover up a lot of our difficulties and pain and and aggression and loneliness. And like, no, it's okay. Like, I'll feel compassion for that instead of maybe, you know, sometimes the decisive action of compassion, which is also needed of, no, I'm, I'm not going to continue that pattern or habit like it's done. And I think whenever we do compassion practices, these similar questions arise because it makes sense. 
it feels very binary, like either I'm holding really tight boundaries and being a hard ass, or I'm like totally open and everyone can like do whatever they want, right? And that's not like it's, you don't become a marshmallow when you practice compassion, but it seems like that sweet, gooey, you know, we, we associate it. And, and sometimes it really is very sweet and loving, but that's again, where there's this beautiful, um, intertwining of clear wisdom and compassion you know it's not the only thing they're really co-arising so thank you raf yeah i love this meditation and um it's a little bit challenging for me this time as having some chronic pain coming in and out but that's not what i wanted to, to bring up it's that often with this meditation i have a feeling similar to what AJ expressed around, well, who am I sharing this with? Who am I to share it? Mm. If I'm just experiencing it for myself, you know, what's the, what is the meaning of that? It doesn't have to mean anything, but all those thoughts come up. And um, I played with something in this meditation because I was starting to have those thoughts as you were um, explaining what we were going to do. So I quickly Googled how many cells are there in my body? <laughs> And played with this idea of, well, you know, I'm sharing with one raft. That's like, that feels like super piddly. <laughs> but if I'm sharing with like 30 trillion living beings that I'm comprised of, like that feels like pretty cool. <laughs> Maybe it's because I just watched Inside Out too last Friday. But <laughs> so. It was a really interesting exercise in mm. feeling a different scale, like mm. a different responsibility. Like, yeah. oh, I've somehow been given the keys to this. 30 trillion cell city, man, that feels like a big deal. Like I should really make sure that they're experiencing some of that good stuff. Cause mm. if I don't, then <clears throat> that's like 30 trillion who aren't. <laughs> so it was actually, it actually amplified the feelings of the meditation for mm. me, um, it, in a really interesting way. Yeah. Beautiful, skillful means, right? Like knowing that it can feel a little too edgy to be like, just for me. And so then, finding the way to ventilate, you know, and make it bigger. It's Beautiful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Any other comments? Yeah. Yeah, just had like looking for beautiful things or moments and just seeing that it's like everything all the time. Yeah. Um, and just like how mind blowing that is uh, to realize like there's like beauty always all around and it's just like waiting for me to just like open up and receive it mm. and that and that could be my greatest gift. Yeah. Like life is always like I got you all this beauty just it's like what it feels like what everything is made of is like the substance is like beauty. Mm. And, and it's like th that, it, it feels like life is like this beautiful like thing or like a, a goddess or something. <laughs> and it's like, just like your spiritual practice is literally just to like open up and be present and enjoy that. And uh, because that's how you give back to what's given to you is mm -hmm. like a, a gift that's not received is denying, like you're taking, you're like, if I receive the gift, then yes. I'm giving the gift of receiving the gift that's being given. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, and I could really hear the bodhicitta in your voice too, in the heart there. And it is, it's such a radical receiving, you know. And it's interesting, again, in, in different um, in different practices and, and earthbound traditions who practice different ways of being with the natural world yeah that <clears throat> it's can you imagine like your friend saying oh I, I went on this amazing trip and I got you this um, this gift and it's so great and you're like no nah, I'm I'm good or like I don't know I don't deserve it or what you know it's like no you have to receive in order to then appreciate and then to you know offer and like that full kind of reciprocal nature with life which is, you know, I think the practice of receiving the good 
it does help us move towards being able to also consider receiving everything, right, as that gift in a way. And the hard stuff, I don't want to say like everything bad that happens to you is a gift and everything bad that happens to you can be transformed by the intention you bring to it. And I think the I think it's so important to practice with the good, with the with really feeling good. I've had many students over the years when I ta- practice um, or teaching emotional skills, and a lot of people have forgotten how to experience feeling good in their body because they've been suppressing the difficult so much that you suppress both. And really that wakening back up to feeling good and doing it with the intention for others, right? Because otherwise it can become very kind of flatly hedonistic. And while hedonistic enjoyment is nice, it's temporary and can really set us up for a lot of suffering if that's all we're looking for. So the more benevolent kind thing is to like immediately offer that extends the joy of it. So, yeah. So let's let's read a little. I mean, he goes so wild with his offerings here. <clears throat> it was really inspiring for me. Um, a bathing chamber, excellently fragrant with floors of crystal, radiant and clear, with graceful pillars shimmering with gems, all hung with gleaming canopies of pearls. Why not? <laughs> There, the blissful Buddhas and their heirs all bathe with precious, a precious vase, a brim with water, sweet and pleasant, all too frequent strains of melody and song, with cloths of unexampled quality, with peerless perfumed towels, I will dry everything and offer splendid clothes, well dyed, of surpassing in excellence. Um, This was the moment um, where I was like, I will offer you the hot chocolate at dandelion chocolate forever, like in an over brimming fountain with more dandelion hot chocolate, (laughs) you know, just like getting so big in our imaginal offerings. And um, it's just so sweet. and with the sumptuous fragment that pervades thousands of millions of worlds, I will anoint the bodies of the Buddhas, light and gleaming and bright like pure burnished gold. Um, flowers and lotus, scented blossoms, all intertwined in scented garlands. I will offer swelling clouds of incense whose ambient perfume ravishes the mind and various foods and every kind of drink and delicacy worthy of the gods. I will offer precious lamps, perfectly contrived as golden lotuses, a bed of flower petals scattering upon um, the level incense sprinkled ground. Wow. Um, Yeah, and it it really goes on. But one thing, I want to share here as like a really beautiful way of thinking about offering. Um, Maybe some folks here have altars in their home or you've become like me where now every room in the home has an altar. And um, there's a way of like really treating the altar like this kind of imaginal sacred space and this place where you can make those offerings. And so maybe some of you already have little objects or other things and this idea um, of like offering flowers, there is this kind of historic idea that it increases our ability to feel love and compassion. So when you're offering the flowers, you know, you're offering it kind of to your own awake nature. Because your altar, I can't remember who said this, but it's like your, I don't know if I love it, but like your, it's your neural workbench. <laughs> it's almost like your mind here. Like, how would you like to arrange your mind? What would you like to offer to your awakening mind? Which we mean mind heart, so not just neural. And then incense is um, also like associated when we're offering incense, it helps with discipline, which is interesting. I actually find it does help focus. So just an invitation to even try for a couple days or a week or for the dedicated practitioner group for a month you know, how do we make these offerings tangible in the day to day? So we're offering this beauty in the representative form of a flower and incense. 
and then think about this offering. Like, what from my day can I offer up? So it could be a little end of the day practice. So I kind of like those um, grounded material practices to help bring this in. Um, I will offer palaces immense and resonant with songs, decked with precious pearls and gems, gleaming treasures fit to ornament the amplitude of space. All this I offer to the bodhisattvas, precious parasols adorned with golden shafts and bordered all around with jeweled fringes, upright, well-proportioned, pleasing to the eye. I give this to all the Vicky, so specific, right? Um, and any of you who've ever been to Bali, maybe have seen there is like offering is and like, it's like a part of the everything like you offer all the time offer with everything. And there's like this real attention to, you know, offering to, you know, the spirits who live behind the stairs of the deck and offering to the spirits who live here and offering here and offering there and it is this kind of love affair with the entire world and creating, you know, in, in Bali, the, the Buddhism is very much intertwined with animism or kind of a more natural interbeing with the world. So it's a real offering to everything and everyone. And, um, you know, it's really sweet to think of this, right? Like we are offering to our awake nature, we're offering to all beings, um, and we can make offerings, right, with our appreciation, make offerings with our presence. I, I do think it can go a little overboard when you are making offerings with everything and it's non-recyclable material, and, you know, so I'd say keep your offerings in your heart, um, in the world, but in your altar, it might be interesting to experiment with that. Okay, good. Qu any questions um, on, on the offerings piece or any other thoughts? on that practice. Yes. Do you mind? Yeah. Thank you. So in the meditation we've done, um, it naturally happened to me, I s started to make offering for the beauty I haven't seen mm. that I'm about to see. <laughs> so I wonder, is that okay? Or <laughs> <laughs> it's a real, it's interesting, you know, because I think it's almost, um, you know, that's you're moving beautifully towards like a, a devotion, you know, just to beauty as it is and the beauty that's unfolding, the beauty that's always already here. We could make an offering to, right? All the beauty I forgot to see today. Which is, it is like a little bit of a different practice, but, you know, and, and this is why this offering, it's so interesting, it's multi-pronged. Again, it's like helping us maybe develop more mindful awareness of the beauty all around us, you know, and then we get to engage with that gratitude and really re, re, kind of re-enrich the heart-mind with appreciation so that we can offer it more fully. So I think what you're describing is like one more layer of mindfulness, you know, the beauty I will receive. Um, so I'd say explore and, and, and see what it's like. I do think the offering practice, you know, this is intended to kind of help prime the pump for our bodhicitta. So it's a way of um, kind of generating the momentum towards opening our heart. And it makes perfect sense, right? Like if we're going to open our heart to suffering of everything, let's also open our heart to the beauty of everything. I've mentioned before I used to work as a um, medical social worker here at SF General in the level one trauma center and I had this little like internal list of how much suffering I saw on a given day I'd have to then engage in that much beauty in another day you know like keeping those internal balances um, so I like this kind of preemptive but I like it like yeah the beauty I will see I'm going to offer the beauty I will see yeah I would like to know how that goes let me know <laughs> Any other questions? I think we will, um, like next week, we will do a little bit more offering and then move to confession. So, um, but I, I wanna like hear for folks who um, are coming more regularly, like how the offering goes, and then we can kind of move from there. 
So what I'd love to do is move us towards a second practice. So let's stand up and move our bodies a little bit. We're actually having summer in San Francisco. It's really weird. <laughs> it's like very unusual, but like warm. Maybe it'll be foggy in September this year. So we're going to return to this practice. Again, if it's your first time, absolutely no problem. In which we're starting to develop a bit of familiarity with the different aspects of mind and awareness. And so in this practice, we begin by noticing thoughts almost like they're in the foreground of our mind, really paying attention to the thoughts as they arise, as they pass away. We could almost imagine these, you know, like little waves coming up. And the ocean is awareness, and the waves, they just like little come and crest, but then they go right back into the greater space of awareness. So we spend time doing that. And then we go to the background of the mind, and that's almost as though instead of kind of being at the wave height, we're really at the view of the entire ocean. And we have a bit more of awareness of our thoughts. And then this unbelievably subtle and yet quite profound shift of becoming aware of being aware. And it is really, it sounds far more sophisticated than it is. It's really this kind of relaxing with brightness. And some of the classic questions, you know, of like, what is aware? Who is aware? Like, what notices the thoughts? And there's an aspect of awareness of awareness that can just be simply described as knowing. So what knows? What is knowing? And so we'll explore that and then give ourselves some time to rest in that knowing, to rest in awareness. And I want to point out one thing and I'll instruct us in the meditation as well but there's a really important distinction between a feeling of spaciousness and a feeling of awareness. Spaciousness can mean we have a little more room between our thoughts. We feel some sense of relaxation and ease, but also we might feel dull. We might not have a kind of clarity in it. It can feel a little bit spaced out. And then with awareness, it's often described, and I find myself experiencing it this way, as this more luminescent quality, this inner radiance. It still has spaciousness, or it exists within spaciousness, but it's not as dull or as thick. It's this kind of radiance and light. So the knowing, maybe understandably, of course the knowing would be bright. The knowing isn't dull. The knowing what we're thinking, the knowing that we've been caught up in thoughts has a real kind of precision and brightness to it. But it's not as though it's leaving, like it's not coming up and out of us to look at the world. 
It's the knowing that we are always existing within. And so with those preliminary words, let's find a really supportive posture, especially with this practice, it's really nice to have uprightness. You may notice if you fall into dullness, your chin will slump, your back will kind of cave over. So being attentive to this supple, upright spine. And finding a sense of ease, relaxation, just throughout the entire body, almost as though you could let your body know it's safe to be relaxed here. Letting the heart be supported by the belly and the belly supported by the sits bones and the whole body supported by the ground. And slipping right into this first phase, noticing thoughts, noticing this foreground of the mind in which thoughts arise and fall like waves. It takes a certain kind of flexibility to allow the thoughts to come and go without getting hitched to them. We can keep a light focus on the breath and belly to remember the anchor. We are not in the thoughts. We are observing the thoughts. And see if you can notice that there are gaps, maybe even just like the blink of an eye, between these thoughts. Non-conceptually, without words or ideas, just sensing and feeling the space between thoughts as well as thoughts as they arise and fall. Some thoughts may feel quicker, more urgent, some slower or less clear. So no needing to engage in the thoughts or even identify the content, but just a sense of these thoughts, like movement of the mind and the space between revealing the stillness of the mind.
And if it's comfortable and not too distracting, it can be helpful to have the eyes a little bit open, letting in light. Seeing if we can take even more time to be noticing the space between thoughts, the space of awareness from which thoughts arise. So leaning to the background of the mind. Of course, thoughts are still coming. There's still movement of the mind. We're leaning back or opening up into the space around thoughts. So the thought may arise of what is that sound? Noticing that arise. And then noticing that space of the mind that could receive the sound. And then in this very subtle way, almost inverting awareness upon itself. Becoming aware of awareness. Aware of knowing. And as much as possible, resting in this awareness of awareness. Body at ease, supple. Mind at ease and supple. Heart at ease, supple.
There may still be thoughts. And we can continue to oscillate between that awareness in the foreground, and returning to resting in the background. Maybe a glimpse here and there of just resting in awareness, aware of itself. And then coming back to the breath and the body. Feeling the chest and the belly, sits bones. Feeling the breath. Just noticing the quality of body, heart, and mind. And offering up any goodness that is experienced in this body, heart, and mind. Thank you for your practice. Got a moment or two. I would love to hear from folks. Any questions or reflections? Share on the topic of beauty. I was thinking, like my friends, and our relationship is really beautiful, and particularly one today. She left her dog in my house while I'm not there because she needed a place to put the dog. And I let the beauty of the relationship wash over me in meditation, and it made me really happy. So that was nice to think about. Mm. And opening it up. Did you say to open awareness after that was like generated? It was mostly an awareness practice, yes. The awareness of it, right? So I was aware of the beauty then, and the openness of how it feels to me. Mm. Thank you, Grace. <laughs> Anybody else want to share? Friends online? Any? any? Hi, Sarana. Must be really late. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Any, yeah, yes, please. So I practiced like opening the eyes when you had said it and uh, sort of creating, not getting caught up in the visual side of mm -hmm. it. And then I started seeing a reflection of myself. Mm -hmm. That was weird. <laughs> it was like. But it was just like the face. Mm. That was really interesting. Mm. So, yeah. But 
then it, it was interesting because like opening the eyes stopped the thoughts and then I closed the eyes and then the stream of thoughts started coming in again. Mm. And I, yeah. Yep. I was, I don't know, do you normally experience thoughts when your eyes are open? Uh, meditation? It totally depends. And, and I really, when I practice eyes open, I really try to have um, an undis like a not as busy visual field as like it being in a sitting hall with others, right. you know, so if you can get like a, especially an open vista, it's great, okay. or even just not a lot of distract, but you can work at the distractions. And I should have said this, but it's like, as far as you can see your, eye, your fingers, like in your peripheral, that's where you want to focus, like on the edges. So that you're not like, and then you'll notice that your eye will go to something. Then, okay, let me go back. Where's the edges? So it makes it more soft. But the seeing back of yourself, I mean, that, that's just super fascinating, right? And, yeah. you know, I think I bet if I dug deep enough into like these ancient texts, that that is a phenomena which occurs. Because definitely the sense of being behind yourself. Yeah, I see myself seeing. Mm -hmm. It makes, you know, it kind of makes like it's again, it is like this confirming sign of like loosening the I am this body in here and awareness is in me. And instead, like, oh, awareness is everywhere. And so then the phenomena that arises from that are very varied, including seeing yourself from behind. I haven't heard seeing yourself from my front, but I bet if I texted my super um, nerdy Buddhist scholar friend, he'd be like, of course, it's in da 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 da, -da you know? Um, but all these interesting disruptions of the kind of body perimeter paradigm occur. And they can be distracting or they can just be like, okay, cool, I'm gonna close my eyes now. <laughs> like, you know, but it's good, you know, and I do think, I'm curious, like, did, it, did you feel a sense of ease within the practice? Yeah. So that's, that's what's important, right? Like that ease within expanding into awareness. Yeah. Thank you. Time for one more in the back. Oh, no problem. It's cool. uh, this is like super minor, but when you were talking about a less cluttered visual field, yeah. then you went to an open vista but my third, first thought was a wall right yeah, in front of you, which is like sure. the exact opposite thing. <clears throat> so I was just wondering. I don't what know if it's that different. Because, <laughs> like, with the Vista, I'm focusing on the sky. Yeah, which is all the, the Great Wall in the. <laughs> yeah, it's a Great Wall in the sky. Yeah, exactly, in the sky. Because I think with even with a wall, you'll be like, whoa, there's that like tiny paint chip. Mm, like, yeah. so the big, I mean, it's more like big than wherever. You know, because then just having that more panoramic view allows the eyes to rest and still bring in light. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <sighs> so beautiful to be here and practice with you all. Um, let's dedicate the merit and we'll do some quick announcements. So hopefully this is so fresh in your heart because this is what we are doing the merit, right? Any generative, positive energy that we have collected here tonight, meaning our thoughts, movements of the heart, insights. We offer all of this up. And the heartfelt aspiration that our practice here tonight can contribute to the possibility that each and every being of all time could know peace and ease. Each and every being of all time could know belonging and love. Each and every being of all time and for all time will be free. So oh, great to be here with you all. Um, I'm sure s we have some announcements. Yeah. Major one is please support us. Our suggested donation is 15 to $30. You can become a monthly supporter. 
and um, volunteer is another way to support us. I still have um, five spots left in a workshop at Esalen in two weeks with myself and Lopan Chandra. Come and join us. Um, also, I am going to be starting a like closed practice group. It'll be meeting weekly, and then we'll do some day longs for a year. Uh, so some folks signed up last week. If you're interested, um, please, I'll put a piece of paper out there. Please sign up. And if you're online and interested, uh, you can, I don't know. Oh, you can write to Serana. Thanks. That's awesome. Um, more details on that to come, but it'll be starting in November.